Welcome all those that are joining us this evening in person and also virtually. I know we have a, a crowd of um, families also joining us virtually. So um, we're just glad that uh, you're attending tonight and I, I want to thank you for your interest. As you've heard us say, you know, our students' safety is our priority and that's safety at school and it's safe within our community. And, you know, together um, we want to continue to partner um, and we're going to uh, be hearing from some of the experts in the field that will be introduced in just a moment um, to give us uh, more background and wise tips as parents and grandparents and how we can continue to be proactive to keep our students and children safe. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our coordinator of safety and security in our district, Mr. Darrell DT. Um, uh, who is going to come forward and, and uh, introduce our speakers this evening. So DT, come on forward. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaligian. Uh, and welcome you all for uh, being here. Thank you for taking the time out to uh, learn about, you know, some of the things that uh, we as uh, adults, we as young people are faced with, you know, every day. And that's that cyber security and drug awareness. Um, I remember way back when, in, in another lifetime, it feels like, you know, when uh, we didn't have cyber security worries you know, in our household. And myself as a parent of uh, four boys and a girl, you know, I, I didn't think much of it. Um, as time has evolved, you know, we have now found that we have to think about cybersecurity. We have to think about what our kids are doing online. And we have to think about, you know, what they're exposed to. And we're talking about narcotics, drugs, uh, and the different types of drugs out there. You know, we'll talk a little bit about that today. And uh, I want to make sure I, you know, tell our speakers, you know, thank you very much for uh, joining us because I think they have some really good information to uh, part that we can learn from. Um, tonight joining us is uh, Detective Christy Huerta from the Sacramento County Deputy, Sacramento County High Tech Crimes Force. She's a uh, detective in that, in that unit. And also Crystal Suchlin, who's our supervising criminalist for the Sacramento County Crime Lab. And again, these are two people who are experts in, in this field. So please, if you have questions, let's make sure that uh, you, you know, ask. We have uh, quite a few folks online too. So those online, if you raise your hand, then uh, we do have uh, folks that are looking out and we'll make sure that we get those questions answered online as well. We're gonna kind of go through the uh, presentation, each one first. And so if you can save your questions to the end, that'd be great. But if it's just a burning and you really wanna know, you know, please feel free you know, to, to throw it out there because we do want to make sure we uh, cover that. Uh, at the end, we have a uh, QR code. We ask you to uh, fill out a survey and provide some information for us at the very end. And again, this is just so we can, you know, to, to get better, we can grow at this. So with that, um, a little bit about myself. I'm uh, with the uh, Folsom Cordova School District for about uh, almost two years now. Uh, prior to that, in another life, uh, I worked the, uh, as a law enforcement officer, you know, here in Sacramento area. For probably about 30 years. Um, I got a great deal of experience, you know, especially when you're talking about drugs, narcotics, and unfortunately, you know, when you get into those realms, you know, cybersecurity comes into play. Um, I remember way back when my, my youngest son was probably nine years old and somebody told me who was on the East Coast that he had a web page. He was, he was online. And for some of y'all, well, a lot of you will recognize it. It's called Facebook, you know. <laughs> You know, and I says, no, you know, my kids, they, they're not into that. Mm, yes, he is. No, he ain't. So he's, he told me where to go to find my son's uh, web page. And sure enough, there he is online, you know. And I uh, look and I say, well, how did he get this, this information, make this web page? You know, you have to be 16. And looking, yeah, he said he's 16. Um, unfortunately for him, he looks like he's five. You know, he was only nine. So, you know, that's, I, that's my first real home, you know, hit where it's like, okay, I got three other boys, two of them are 10 years older, what are they doing? You know, and yeah, come to find out they all had, you know, pages, you know, and they've been on the internet a lot, lot longer than I realize. Um, you come to uh, 2023, you know, we have so many things on the internet that our kids are involved in and they can get anything. You do not have to leave your house anymore because of the internet. You know, 
TikTok, oh my God, it's, it's, it, it's captured adults as well. But anyway, I'm going to let the experts talk about that. So because, I, again, I know how it is as a uh, parent, but also as a law enforcement officer, you know, how important this information is and how we need to, uh, you know, really take it, hold of it and, and, and look and see what our kids are doing. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Detective Horta to come up. Hiroto. I'm so sorry. Crystal. Crystal. I forgot to ask about the clicker part. Oh, There's a clicker, a clicker part. Oh, great. Thank you. I have 45 minutes, right? Yes. So I'm going to cram this in. I'm going to try not to talk too fast. Um, so I'm Detective Christy Hirota. I've been with the Sacramento mm -hmm. Sheriff's Office for 21 years, and I've been doing specifically internet crimes against children for 10 years. So I was giving this presentation over, I don't know, probably, probably the last eight years with Folsom Cordova, and it has changed the way my perspective is in giving it now because I have a middle schooler and I'm living this. So before I was sitting there telling you guys what you should do and it was like an easy thing, it's not. <clears throat> it's not an easy thing to do at all. So um, in the interest of time, I will kind of just buzz through some of these things. Um, and I'm used to walking, so I'm gonna have to stay right here. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, devices, some of the apps that we are dealing with, sextortion, which has been a really huge problem for us. Um, a little bit of sexting and then grooming um, has been an issue and then some internet safety things that we can do. Um, somebody posted this, uh, Bark is an app that you can use to monitor your children's um, social media. And I thought this was kind of funny because nobody told me parenting in 2022 is 70% of checking your children's phones. Because essentially that's what it is. It's, it's a lot of work. Have, have any of you been in here checking your kids' phones? <clears throat> Some of you. It's a lot of work it, it, in, it, to be able to go through when you have your own stuff going on. So <clears throat> one of the things I talk about is some parents don't even check their kids' phones. They just give them a phone and then wait for something bad to happen. And so my whole thing is, if you're locking your front door, if you're locking your windows, if you put an alarm on your house, you should definitely check your kid's phone because literally you're letting the entire world have access to your children when you give them that device. Literally, somebody from another country is potentially communicating with your child. And so we really cannot keep our heads in the sand anymore. We really, really have to take this very serious and treat it as is it something that's, that's important because kids are being victimized. And don't think it's not going to be your child because I promise you, I promise you, I've getting phone calls literally almost every day it's becoming of people I know calling to say that their friend or their family member, their child has been a victim of sextortion or something along those lines. And so we really have to make sure that we pay attention to that. And so this isn't just happening to a very specific group of people. It's happening to all walks of life, um, social economic backgrounds, races, uh, genders. Um, it's happening to everybody. So it's not very, it's not specific at all. Um, and I will tell you, if you were to tell me that my daughter was talking to somebody she shouldn't, I will say that even though she's been trained and she knows really well what to do and not to do, it wouldn't surprise me just because once kids get on the internet, they start talking to people, you know, things just happen when they start chatting with people. So it, you can't say that you don't think your child's going to do it. And one of my partners <clears throat> had a suspect here in Sacramento that we arrested, and we went into his phone and we found hundreds of children that he'd been communicating with across the, the world, essentially. And he and an analyst were working through, going through those images to being able to identify who these children were. And so we would identify him based on shirts with emblems on the on their shirts or you know things in the background. And he would call these parents and say, hey, by the way, we have a suspect in Sacramento who's been communicating with your 12-year-old, sending nude images, and the parents on the phone, nope, not, nope, my kid's not doing it. And then we're like, sorry, and we send like a screen capture of a um, sanitized photo with something in the background, like um, you know, the, the bathroom or something. And the parents like to hear their to hear them like just be silenced and like, oh my God, I cannot believe that this is happening. So just know that it although you you know talk to your children it could happen to your kids <clears throat> and the one really big thing that i have to emphasize is that you make these in the treatable or teachable moments and some of the parents on the phone <laughs> were with their children when when we call to tell them hey by the way your kid's been chatting with this person they just instantly start screaming and yelling at their kid in the background so we have to like so then so my partner um detective heaton had to in the beginning start giving a little um little thing in the beginning to the parents. Hey, I'm going to tell you something right now, but if your kid's in the room, they need to leave, and then just don't start yelling and screaming at them. 
because we need to be able to make this teachable so that later if this happens again, unfortunately, they'll be able to go somewhere so they can talk to somebody. Um, so one of the things is you just need to make sure that you are communicating. So to, to, how do we start all this? We just start need to communicate with our children at a, a really young age. So even at kindergarten, any kindergartners in here? Some, okay. As crazy as it sounds, you just need to start talking to them super early and it's obviously age appropriate. So there'll be some, a lot of QR codes throughout this presentation that you can take your phone and, and get the, the web browser and then Later in your spare time, you can go through all your web, open web browsers and you can <laughs> research all of that stuff, I know, when you're laying in bed at night. Um, <clears throat> so in the interest of time. So for the devices that the kids are using, they're pretty much using everything. They're using watches, they're using old iPhones or old phones that are in your house that are broken, um, iPods, gaming devices, you name it, iPads. So if you have those old phones in your house, and your kid's been grounded, you took their phone away from them, just know that they can still access the internet with those devices. Um, a lot of kids will be using different types of gaming platforms to start talking to people. Okay, we got, we got the point. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, mess it, I, I mentioned this earlier already. You're giving the entire world access to your children. So kind of like when you give your, key, your kid the keys to the car, to the car you're going to want they go to classes, they learn how to do it. Unfortunately, that's what needs to happen with these devices. You really do need to sit down and tell them these are the things that could potentially happen to you, and this is how you're going to use your phone. You're not going to talk to people you don't know. You're not going to send photos of yourself to other people, things of that nature. Because to be honest, they don't know. I mean, they don't know, right? Like we didn't grow up with this stuff, so we can just assume that they know, but they don't know. So... <clears throat> there actually is a, a method to this madness. So um, there are five ICACs, Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, in California. Every single state has one. We're lucky enough to have five. The Sacramento Sheriff's Office, we're the ones that get all the cyber tips from all of the electronic service providers whenever someone reports um, images or conversations or something. And so we get them at the Sheriff's Office, and we divvy them out to the different agencies that are covered within our area, which is the blue area. So as you can see, it's a pretty large area that we cover. So we assist those, those other agencies. We help them serve search warrants. We educate them on how to do this, um, do cyber tips. And so uh, many of you might have heard these, this material that kids are taking pictures of themselves nude, uh, CP, right? Child pornography. Um, well, we've changed that to... CSAM, child sexual abuse material, because essentially when you think of pornography, it's something that an adult willingly took a photo of themselves, right? Well, these children are not willingly participating in this. Um, so it, these are images of children being abused. These are essentially their crime scene photos that are being published and other people are seeing them. So these are, this is child sexual abuse material, so we no longer call it CP. <clears throat> so for us, um, we mainly, obviously we investigate um, any, any crimes that are involving CSAM in addition to identifying and locating children who are being abused and rescuing, rescuing them from those situations. And then we work with um, state, federal, and local um, agencies. And many of us are really sworn as U.S. Marshals so that we can do federal cases because unfortunately with the local um, charges that we get, it is really bad. So if you ever see any type of legislation on the books talking about um, the crimes that people are committing for, with child, child sexual abuse material, they're getting like 30 days, they're getting work project, they're getting um, time served. Whereas if we do federal cases, possession in and of itself could potentially be a five-year mandatory minimum, which is a lot better than 30 days or an ankle monitor. People have no idea. They think, oh, they get like five or 10 years. No, they don't. <laughs> so if you ever see that legislation, make sure you pay attention to it. <clears throat> so the US, um, I'm sorry, so the National Center for missing and exploited children, which we refer to as NCMEC. They're essentially the clearinghouse that gets all of these cyber tips. And so Google, Dropbox, Snapchat, Snapchat are all required by law to report any images of child sexual abuse material that comes on their servers. They're supposed to report it. In addition to that, um, if the public, for instance, any of you were, your child's been a victim, then you report it to the National Center. And then, um, then the National Center will figure out where this potential case belongs and they'll send it to the appropriate ICAC agency. So if you can see here, I didn't start keeping statistics till 2016, but look how many cyber tips we've gotten. There are so many, we were up at 11,000 when I asked our cyber tip manager 
And that's like a full-time job with retired annuitants helping him manage that because we've gotten so many of them. So I always get the question of what are the bad apps out there? I will tell you that every single app that's out there has the potential to be bad. For example, I've had cyber tips on Pinterest and it's because people are posting images that they're not supposed to. And so just keep that in mind. And a lot of these apps, the kids are supposed to be 13 years old, but we all know that kids lie and they'll change their age so that they can have these accounts. Um, <clears throat> But if, if you wanna do this QR code, this is interesting. Uh, it's about children's information. Technically, not just with the internet stuff, um, but just in general, children's identifying information. This is a, a good place to go and read up on what information is supposed to be out there on children. And that way you just, as a parent, know that you're educated. Because I had no idea about this until I started doing this job. Um, how many kids play Roblox? Oh, probably every kid, yeah. So again, it's one of those, you know, kind of you seem innocent app. It can be obviously. Uh, this QR code will give you some information. And I will tell you that these apps, there's so many of them, we cannot keep track of them ourselves. We get a call from patrol. They're like, yeah, we're on this Be Real app. And I'm like, I haven't heard of that. So we have to go Google it and figure out what it is and what it's capable of doing. So in addition to that, these things are always changing. So when I do presentations, I make a PowerPoint, I put up information, and the next time it's changed. So we all have to be aware of these changing um, attributes that are occurring within these apps, and we just have to read stuff. I know it, it's a lot of work. So with the um, algorithms, you know, technically you're supposed to train it and you can get it to be what you want it to be, but sometimes that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, <clears throat> so on this Roblox, you can chat like with many of, many of the other apps, but um, have any of you actually been on Roblox? It's, it's really hard, actually. I tried um, communicating on it with a bad guy and I had a hard time because surprisingly, they're really good about cutting out. So if you see up there all those little... Um, hashtags it's because I was writing something to the effect of where do you live and it wouldn't let me write it so that's one good thing about Roblox it'll it'll see those things and it'll prevent them from happening but this is where the bad guys will typically talk to your kids and know to have to move to a different platform because they know that this will block stuff um, <clears throat> so I don't know if you've seen this have any of you seen nudity on Roblox this is a screen capture from a child's Roblox and it worries me because when my kid plays, I'm always looking. I'm always like, what, what are you looking at? Because I want to make sure that this isn't happening or um, you're not seeing any type of this nudity. So again, with any other app, this potentially could happen where your kids are playing and this person is grooming your child, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so you pretty much just have to just go through your child's um, Roblox or whatever other apps that they're, they're using and you just need to go through it and see exactly what they're doing. But pretty much, I just tell children, you should not be chatting with people that you don't know face to face. TikTok, um, my kid has been dying for TikTok and I'm like, absolutely not because me as an adult going through TikTok, this is me last year. I just, I haven't put TikTok back on my phone. This is what I came across in the first time I opened this TikTok. There's curse words, there's sexuality, there's suicide, there's hate, there's um, just weird stuff. <laughs> um, and so when your kids are looking at TikTok and they start running across all these things, you're just exposing your children to things they really shouldn't be seeing at a young age. So, and so I know at one point this, the district had um, screenagers played at uh, Folsom Middle School, and maybe that's something you guys can do again, have them come back, and it's a really great TV. Now they've got a second one where they talk about the effects of um, social media and telephones and gaming on children's brains and, and them forming. We're not gonna really know, our kids are like guinea pigs, but you yourself can go to Screenagers <clears throat> and also um, um, research it yourself. They have a book that, that she sells, and there's, they have podcasts, which are really good. I myself listen to the podcast. Um, so YouTube, I know every single child has been on YouTube. That's what they, I mean, we're on YouTube to learn how to change our wipers on our car. So, but that's the other problem with YouTube is that your children are looking and they're just, you know, you know how it is. You get on YouTube and TikTok and you just start, you know, 
um, going through it and you just end up in this rabbit hole and you have no idea how you spend an hour just looking at a bunch of nothing. So I know with kids, again, it's mainly the issue with that is this the inappropriate material. So you can go in there and with this QR code, you can go in there and look at the settings and obviously make it so that your kids are not looking at specific content, that they're not looking at um, certain websites you can block. But YouTube did create one for children and apparently it's supposed to, as the child progresses, you're, it'll, it'll add additional things as the child gets older. So has anybody used this before? You have? Do you notice the difference? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they cut out a lot of the material. It's just more cartoony. It's more mm -hmm. that type of stuff. But I, I was really going to ask you about that. Is it, is it really safe? Is it really what? Is safe? It really safe? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, nothing's really safe. But, right. the, but I mean, that's a lot better because, one, your kids are not exposed to all this material that's going around. But then kids get bored like, oh, this is too cartoony. But, you know, this reality is we have to you know, protect your eyes. But I mean, there's really, there's, there's no place for them to really go and find people or, or like a Facebook where you can connect with people. So it, it is a lot safer than the other platform. On YouTube, they had, you know, you, there would be videos of like, you know, uh, cartoons or other types of kid type material that then had like disturbing images kind of, you know, se sequenced into it and, and, and everything else. It was like, it was like a, a, a bait or yeah, and I I don't know. There's a there's a slide thing about that that talks about that they it looks like it's a cartoon and then it it starts off that way and then it leads into something sexual. Yeah. Um, some sites do that, but with YouTube, they, because of their they're always searching their their servers for that stuff. It it likely should not be there, and if it is, you're supposed to report it. Um, but then this is just kind of talking about the exposure of, of sex to children at a young age. So we're not going to really get into this, but just know that. Children are being obviously exposed to these images. And let me tell you, some of those chats that we read, that we read with these nine-year-olds with adults will blow your mind away. <laughs> so don't think my nine-year-old doesn't know about sex or they don't know how to talk that way because they do. And it's very scary. Snapchat, it's again, it's one of those things where you can make it so that your pictures disappear, but then we all know that they can screen capture. So a lot of kids at school think it's a sure way, surefire way for them to be able to communicate and it's going to disappear. Well, we know that they get screen captured, but then again, it's the same like all the other platforms. It's just a place for your child to potentially communicate with people they don't know, and we don't want them doing that. Um, and this is crazy. I was just talking to somebody, and their kids have their phone not in ghost mode. And what ghost mode is, it doesn't tell you where your location is. So if you don't put your phone specifically in ghost mode, it is going to show where you're at. So when you post something, see all these little blue things up here? These little. So when you keep on going in closer and closer, it'll show you the video that you're posting in addition to your username. And so um, you just really need to make sure that your kids are not posting their location on their phones. And I mean, for adults too, I wouldn't do it. <clears throat> yes it think yes yeah if you're not posting where you're at if you're looking around they can see where you're where you are yes if we get a question just repeat it so that they'll oh yes hear it, um i already forgot um oh with <laughs> keep, keep going Yes, if your kids are not posting, it will still show your location. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, Omegle, have any of you heard of this? This is a horrible site. And let me tell you, kids go on sleepovers. They go to each other's house, and they think this is funny. Let's go on Omegle because they hear about it at school. And the minute you get on there, you will see, you know, inappropriate material. Instantly, you will see male parts popping up on the screen. And so this is a site that I will go into my computer or your child's phone, and I will specifically put it in there and block it because this is, when you look at this site, it, like, it makes your eyes like disgusting. <laughs> it's really a bad place for your kids to be. And so this is another place where it's supposed to be anonymous, and so kids will chat, and then the suspect will somehow hook the child and get them to go to a different platform. So... You need to make sure that your kids are never, if, if you look at their user history, that they're never using this site. These other three sites, do any of your kids use these sites? Okay, and they're using them probably to 
communicate with family in another country? No, just using them? Discord for video games. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, if your kids are using any of these three apps besides for gaming or chatting with relatives in another country, because that's what typically people use it for because it's free to be able to, to communicate and send pictures, um, I really wouldn't have your kids doing using these apps because these are ones where a lot of our kids are being victimized. People, It's just like a catfishing. They'll send a message out, someone will catch it, and then they'll just start chatting with them. So, or if your kids are going to be using it, just make sure you go through and, and see what they're doing on these, on, on these three apps here. A lot of our uh, CSAM suspects are on these apps, mostly Discord and Kick. <clears throat> Instagram, um, we've been actually surprisingly having some issues with Instagram. It's typical, it's the sextortion, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But the other problem we're having is that people will create fake uh, Instagram accounts, like um, to post fight videos or um, make fake one of a person, a child, and post things that are embarrassing. And the kids out there don't think that we'll know about it, but of course we will. We can write search warrants for the IP, the internet protocol address, and figure out where it's being made. So just let your kids know, don't create an account because you think it's funny of somebody else because it'll come back to you. Mom and dad will, you know, kick the door in with a search warrant. So just keep that in mind. Um, so Be Real, I just recently heard about it. And is any of your kids using Be Real? So essentially what you do is you wake up every day and you take a video or, or, or photo of yourself, wherever it is that you're at every single day so that everybody knows where you are. So one, the problem with that is is that you're constantly taking videos of yourself in places, so it gives it an outlet for people to figure out where you are if they're strangers looking at it. And then, of course, um, you know, people are posting things, and of course, there's like the bullying, cyberbullying that goes on with it. And then um, it, it becomes stressful because I hear kids say, oh my God, I have to post something, or I didn't want to post something, but everyone at school's pressuring me, I need to post something. So. You know, it's up to you if you want to just have discussions with your kid if they're going to be using this, this new app where you're posting uh, something about yourself every single day. Um, gaming, I'm sure a lot of kids are gaming. And so just how this all works is that we get a lot of kids who are gaming on Xbox and PlayStation and all those, and they're chatting. And I, every time I go do a presentation to kids, I always ask, are you chatting with people? And they are. And so... I've just realized that we have to just know that our kids are chatting with people. Hopefully it's people they know, but we really don't want them chatting with people they don't know because historically it's a, it's a pattern. They're playing video games, the bad guy's chatting, grooming them. Oh, you're a great player. Oh, I see you're a 49ers fan. And then it just, they keep on communicating and then it goes to moving over to um, Snapchat they start chatting there, and then it moves to texting on their cell phone. And then that's when they start you know, asking for photos, and it just gets into that point where they have a, a relationship. And then the person's going to ask to meet your child. Do not think this does not happen, because it does. It moves from gaming to a platform to text messaging to meeting in person. So if you're going to have I, – I simply, in the beginning, was telling parents, don't have your kids chat with people they don't know. But unfortunately, I can't really – really say that because I know it's just a part of the game is chatting with people. So you as a parent just have to figure out how you want to maneuver that with your kids chatting with first, if you, they definitively know it's the neighbor down the street or their, their classmates, that's fine. But really chatting with people you don't know, they're likely going to be adults, you know, that are in another state. Um, let's see. We talked about that. Um, so some of the things, um, so even for us adults, we should keep all of our accounts private, right? Even though it's not a sure 100%, you know, it's going to keep you safe. But it's definitely one little thing that you can do is to make sure that your, us old people, Facebook account is, is private, our Instagram, our Snapchat, all of that's private in addition to your kids. Because I was talking to this girl last week. She met somebody she didn't know. And her mother and I were on speaker. And she was trying to convince me that the person she's chatting with in Florida is a real person by telling me that three of her friends from school have mutual friends with this person, that she's FaceTimed this person. And I was just trying to explain that even though you're FaceTiming with these people, they may not necessarily be who they are because we've had cases where people know how to maneuver and trick people with using FaceTime or Skype, and it's really not them. So 
everything that she was telling me was total class, classic textbook, convincing me. So finally I just told the mom, listen, you decide what you want to do. This is your child. But as far as I know, based on the information I have, this appears to be an adult in another state. But at that point, we, hadn't, we haven't got a crime yet. We just had them starting to communicate, and they caught it. But that was about it. So, um, so I don't know how I got on that subject. Um, and then that's the other thing, too, is the, the accepting followers that you don't know. Of course, we don't want to do that. But we definitely don't want to accept friend requests from people that we don't know personally face-to-face, -face, just because we know that that's what part of the, the suspects do is they – they infiltrate somebody else's account and they're really not friends with them and then they join friends with you and it looks like that they're friends but in reality your friend has no idea that they accepted this person as a friend and so that's how they get into your accounts so it's simply the best rule is just do not be friends with people you don't know um, and of course like I said just if you don't know anything about these apps that your kids are using you should just google it that's what we do so any of these apps that your kids are using, you just need to go into the settings and you need to, I know it's like getting a manual. You need to read about some of this, the settings. You yourself put them on your phone and kind of play around with them. So I do that. Get on there, just figure out how this thing works before you decide to give your kids these different apps. Quickly, we'll go over bullying. I know cyberbullying has been an issue with kids in terms of, um, sending messages to each other, and then it goes home with them, and then um, posting fight videos at school. Kids, you know, become uh, potentially become depressed or, or suicidal. So you just need to talk to your children. First, you know, don't be doing those things yourself. Don't be videoing fights and posting on places. Um, don't be saying, you know, all these things to people because if your child ends up eventually becoming suicidal, a child becomes suicidal, and your child was a result of, that person potentially committing suicide, they could potentially be sued. There's tons of cases across the United States where this has been an issue. Um, but if your child is being bullied, um, one of the things, obviously, the first thing to do is just, you know, ignore it, delete it, and block it, and hope that ends the problem. And if it doesn't, and it continues, then you could potentially talk to the parents. But I know that with that example, some parents have said, well, I call the other parent and they're like, my kid would never do that. But it's unfortunate because some of us would be like, well, let me look into this. And you look and you reasonably see that your child's been doing that and you can talk to your kids. But some parents aren't like that. So um, if it gets even worse and worse, if it's an issue that is occurring at school <laughs> and at home, then you can figure out how you want <laughs> to work that. Yes. So the question was, how do you remove all of those fight Instagram pages, for example, um, and that you keep reporting them over and over? It's, it's crazy that you have to do that because I have several cases where kids' photos end up on social media, and I, myself, report it with my email account. I send it numerous times. The parents do it. Their friends do it. Um, and it doesn't get taken down. So there's a new thing called Take It Down, which will be I'll show you. It's a site where anybody's information, and even kids can can send this to, to it's through NCMEC, National Center. They can send these images, and it should be taken down. And I'll explain a little bit further um, about that. But it is ridiculous. That's why at some point we need to hold these uh, electronic service providers accountable because it is crazy the amount of work you have to do to try and get these images off. Um, these are just some examples of what the bullying is. Okay, I have to go. Okay. Um, so for your kids, if you just want to in the beginning, this is a part of the age appropriate thing is in the beginning, it's like things like this. It's more like the, the etiquette of being on the internet when you're younger. And then so they can just build on that. But it's partly, you know, just don't be mean. Don't, you know, try not to gossip and all that stuff. And just let your kids know that they can post things anonymously, but just know that it can be traced. Like we can figure out who's posting these things. So there's not very many... Um, actual codes pertaining to um, the internet. I mean, there's becoming more and more, but one of the things is if somebody was to create a fake profile of your child, 
um, there's a, or any, an adult for that matter, there's a crime code that's the identity theft. So essentially it's an identity theft. You can cover that underneath it. So, um, but posting real information of a real child that's identifying, that's a crime in of itself. So when those people make those fake pages and they put your child's name in their picture, that, that, that's actually a crime. Um, yes? What happened? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, if your child is being bullied or and you call the police and let them know, like what realistically, what is the, the resolution? Harassing and all that. Yeah. So it, because of our caseload is so big, um, we have to triage our cases. But so typically those will just kind of write reports and, you know, at least have it noted. But then if we have other ex ex other circumstances are occurring. For example, it's continual harassment that keeps on occurring, or new counts keep popping up, or somebody becomes suicidal, or someone's being physically threatened, then we will do more for that particular case. But it's unfortunate that we have to triage the cases. It really, it really is um, that that has to happen. So I know San Jose had a lot of suicides from being bullied, um, but this is something that's that's been happening. So that's why, you know, we need to talk to our kids about not bullying other children um, because they could potentially have issues that occur where the kid kills himself or, and of course you as a parent, unfortunately, you know, you're going to have to deal with uh, um, being civilly sued. The child's going to, you know, get expelled, that type of thing. So that is a really big thing. But for your kids, if they are being bullied, it's just do those things, delete, block, and um, if you need to report it just because you feel like you need to, because it might happen again, then you can just at least make an info report. But you can do all of this through the National Center. Like if you feel like I need to report this, but I'm not sure if it really warrants the, the sheriffs or police getting involved, then you can report all of this stuff to the National Center for Missing and Exploded Children. I'll give you the cyber tip line. And they will at least have it documented. And it'll be there forever. So it's deconfliction. So the next time this person does it again, the username, it'll be in there in the whoever's getting the case will see that it's been reported before. Um, sexting, I'm just going to run through this. Obviously, kids are, you know, they're, they're curious. They're going to start sending nude photos to their boyfriend or their girlfriend. So just remind your children, do not send photos of yourself to anybody. Do not send sexually explicit photos to your boyfriend because next week you'll be broken up and that picture may end up around the school. And once you push send, you'll never get it back but there's a potential way to get it taken down now. Um, and then just tell your kids, just don't take photos of yourself nude because it's in your phone. There's a sleepover. You're in the shower. Somebody else gets your phone because they know the password. They see that you took all these photos for your, your boyfriend and they send it to themselves and then they start sending it around the school. So just don't take pictures. That is the way to avoid this problem. Do not send or take pictures of yourself nude. Um, this QR, QR code, if you wanted to find, have conversations with your kids about, you know, sexting, <clears throat> and you can kind of start off a conversation with your kids. Have, has, has anybody ever asked you to send photos? That's another thing. You probably need to have a conversation before it happens. So maybe talk to your kids. Hey, if somebody says, Hey, um, can you send me a, you know, you know what photos I'm talking about, then you can maybe address it now and have a conversation with them. Just tell them to ignore them. Do not continue to have conversation with that person. Don't, you know, don't, you can say no and then just be done with it. But just go to this um, QR code and, and look at some of the things that you can do to talk to your kids about it. Um, so do you play this? Can you play that or do I play it? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Michelle Delon, CEO and President here at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And I'm Chris Ray, Director of the FBI. We're here together to share important information about a disturbing crime targeting our kids. It's called sextortion. You may have heard about this before, but the trend we're seeing now shows that this problem is growing. And sadly, this form of extortion has even led to some children taking their own lives. And we want you to know that help is out there. So first, what is sextortion? It's a form of online blackmail using nude images. 
The blackmail part happens when somebody threatens to share the private images if their demands aren't met. Often they demand money, electronically or in other forms, or they demand more sexual imagery. And we've actually seen an increase in the targeting of teenage males. And as if that wasn't tragic enough, as Michelle just mentioned, an alarming number of these victims have ended up committing suicide because perpetrators' continuing demands make victims feel isolated, embarrassed, and trapped. Young people are being targeted on social media and gaming platforms where they're approached by somebody who wants to chat. These offenders are organized and they are deliberately targeting children. They will use fake pictures and fake profiles and appear to be a similar age to the child. Then they'll use attention and flattery to convince the child to share nude images and videos. And after obtaining compromising images, these perpetrators will either demand payment or force the victim to create more explicit material. And if the victim doesn't, they'll threaten to send the images to the victim's friends, parents, or school. And understandably, this can be overwhelming. Many kids feel like there is no way out, but help is available. Any child or teen can become a victim. So here are some tips to share with your kids about staying safe. First, be suspicious if someone you meet on a game or an app asks you to start communicating with them on a different platform. Second, never send compromising images of yourself to anyone, no matter who they are or who they say they are. And third, don't open attachments from people you don't actually know. And should this happen to a child you know, please do not delete any of the communications and immediately contact local law enforcement then report it to the cyber tip line. The key to fighting this troubling crime is educating the children in your life. They are not alone and help is available. So, <clears throat> sex, Hi, I'm sextortion. I can hear myself talking. <laughs> uh, so sextortion is huge. I'm getting phone calls every single week, once or twice a week, three times a week about somebody's child being ex sextorted. So victims can be anybody, so we're running out of time, so I'm gonna talk fast. Um, it can be anybody, and, it, and don't think it's just girls, it is boys. Most of the calls they've been getting have been boys. Um, and it's something that can happen really quick, or it can be something that happens over a period of time. It's both. Um, so again, we said this earlier, don't think it's, it can't happen to your kids, because because it can. So there's a couple different things. What will happen is the suspect will be fishing. They'll literally send out a bunch of messages to a bunch of kids, hoping that one bites. And when the kid bites, they'll start chatting and they'll start essentially quit grooming where they say, oh, again, you're, you, you look pretty, you're, you look nice, nobody understands you. And then what, what's, your, um, what's your Instagram account? They go to Instagram, become friends. And that is where the suspect will go and collect all of the child's friends and family and screen capture it and make it into a collage. Then the suspect will say, hey, I need you to send me um, a nude photo. And the kid's like, I'm not gonna do that. Or the kid already did send some sort of um, inappropriate photo, maybe just breast or something. Um, and the suspect's like, well, if you don't, I'm going to tell all of your friends and family. And then they'll say, they'll show a screen capture of that collage of all their friends and family. So the kid's like, oh crap, what am I supposed to do? If I give them some more photos, or if I give him or they'll request money, then he'll go away. The kids do not understand, they will not go away. And so the kids that don't send nude photos originally, they, the suspect will send a photo of another child and say, hey, I'm gonna send this to your friends and family. And so the kid's of course mortified. And so then they'll send a photo when they never really had sent a photo. Um, but the crazy thing is they're asking for gift cards now. That has been the big thing lately is gift cards because they know kids get gift cards for Christmas, right? So, um, Kids are sending gift cards. And even kids are getting their parents, like 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds are going to their parents' wallet and getting their ATM card and putting it in their phone and sending it to these bad guys. I, I have friends whose kids did that. So um, just know that you have to talk to your kids about talking to people they don't know. You really should not do that. So if you don't do that, then this will not happen. Do not send photos of yourself to people or this will not happen. Um, but just know that this has been a really big, huge thing. And as a result, um, back um, this year, 
a, a kid from San Jose killed himself um, from being sextorted. And so we in Sacramento County had the 19th child who killed himself from being extorted as of a month ago that we know of. Okay, and so this person's bad guy was in Nigeria. So there's Nigeria and Ivory Coast. So literally, this is like a business for them. Um, I mean, there's, of course, all the perverts that are in the United States that are doing this for fun, but there's also this big, huge ring. And so the HSI and FBI have split up the countries, and they're actually actively working these. So if your kid becomes a victim, and it's very early, and there's something you don't think that us would be able to do right away, just at least report it to the National Center, and then they can funnel it to us. But this kid killed himself. And, and all these kids here that killed themselves, they're all really good students. And if you go and list, look at their stories of their parents talking about them, it's all the exact same thing. They're good students. They were popular. And this last um, person who ended his life, he was 16, and it happened super quick. On sex, It went from uh, Snapchat to Instagram, super fast. And the parents are so upset because they cannot believe, because they're so close with their son, that he did this. They, they still cannot, they're so upset about this, they cannot believe that he would go as far as to go kill himself because we can get through anything. Like, that's why you need to talk to your kids and let them know, if you do something stupid, we need to have a discussion about it uh, in, in a nice manner so that if they do something again, it's not gonna be the end of the world. Um, so take it down. I think there's two. So, so this is really great. So uh, I went to the ICAT conference in Dallas this year, and I actually went to the conference and I spoke to them. And so if you come across any images of your children on any platforms, or if your child does for that matter, you can take the link and you can put it in this take it down. And they will go and make a report of it, and then they will send a notification to that platform. So. Snapchat, they'll send a notification saying, hey, this is a minor, you need to take this image down. And then they will continue weekly to set alarms, they have this thing set up where that they will go in and check to see if that, if that picture has been taken down. And they will continue to send notifications until it's taken down. And it's difficult for them, like you're saying, it's difficult for us to take it down, it's difficult for them to take it down. So at some point they need to be held accountable for this. I mean, I've been working with this other kid and we've, we're still trying to get his photos off of there, his account. And that doesn't just include photos. That means if they have a, a fake account. So one of the bad guys created a fake account with his child's info. So um, you can use this as well to, for, for images and for uh, fake accounts. In addition to reporting it to that platform. So just report it wherever you can report it. The platform, take it down, the National Center, do it all. And it's really unfortunate that we have to do this. Really is unfortunate. Um, so there's a movie called um, Sextortion, The Hidden Pandemic. I think you can get it on Netflix, I think. But um, if you want to watch that or go to the website, they have little blurbs about it. It really is becoming a really big, huge thing. Kids are constantly being sextorted for images or money. Um, grooming, well, grooming. So pretty much um, this grooming can occur in person and can also occur online. And they're exactly the same thing. Um, a person will find somebody and, um, and it could be in person, like I said, or online, find somebody who might potentially be vulnerable or nowadays people are just, um, suspects are just looking for people in general to um, say nice things to, um, do nice things for them, um, Make it so that the kids, you know, like your parents are, you know, your parents are horrible. I understand where you're coming from. Try to relate, be more relatable to them, um, allowing them to do things that their parents won't do. And so these right here are all things that I've had suspects give to children. Trips, phones, game boxes, um, gift cards, alcohol, chocolate, <laughs> um, all of those things. So just remember, if, so if your child is being given gifts that they shouldn't be given, then that's really a sign. Don't think, oh, this person's so nice. No, no, really, there should be no adult giving your child a phone, like there's, or gift cards. I mean, of course, if it's a, a friend, it's a gift, you know, that obviously we know that. But I'm just saying, like a person who's kind of disconnected from you or a stranger, um, just keep that in mind that grooming is something that also occurs not just with the child, but it'll, the person will start grooming their friends and family. 
So whenever you hear those, you know, he was such a nice guy. Well, yeah, because he's groomed everybody. Um, so essentially, just tell your children, just remember, whenever you're talking to people, because kids always swear up and down, I know that that's a girl that's my age, and it's not. Um, we did an undercover op recently. We've done two of them where we posed as 12-year-old girls and boys, and we arrested all these people. They came to meet us to, you know. So um, just let your kids know. So I always show these to kids when they're, they're chatting with people, like, these are the people you're talking to. And thankfully, they came to meet us and not you guys. Um, if you want to, for your younger kids, start talking about rules of their body. This is a good, simple place to go to. Um, I know, so we have two seconds left. Um, so let's start off just by telling your kids that they just, you just need to sit down and communicate with your kids, have discussions with them about all of these things before you give them their phone and give them rules. And if you have to make a contract like I did, which I will give them all these, um, I'll give you a bunch of material for you to post for people. Yes, sir. Well, just, just a quick question. I, I know, um, with the people sending pictures, but in this day and age, and I've talked to some people out in Placer County that are uh, AI-generated pictures mm. that people are making and sending out. So even if your kid doesn't send nudes, if they have a picture of your child, they are making AI-generated pictures, and they're posting those as well. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up because, Sergeant, would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, that is... Let's give the mic, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> We just did a, a, show, uh, a, a new segment that is supposed to be coming out. My name is Sergeant Steinorf. I'm uh, the supervisor of the High Tech Crimes Task Force. Um, and I, unfortunately, I'm not the expert on the AI. But I will just comment that uh, that is ever changing right now. And we're just honestly just seeing the tip of the iceberg with it. So again, having those pictures out of anyone is it's going to be, become an issue. Legislatures are looking right now, legislators, I'm sorry, are looking right now at the possibility of what they can do to assist us with that. But it's, I don't have an answer or, or even uh, what to tell you right now, but it's something to be very much aware of. Yeah, and for us trying to look at images, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's something going to be a challenge. Um, just so, be, just be careful of what you're posting on any sites with, you know, stuff in the background. That's how we identify suspects or, or victims. Same thing bad guys are doing. They're trying to vic fight, figure out where your kids live. Yes. So one of the things I started wrote was communicate, and that sounds great. Uh, one issue with middle schoolers is they don't want to listen to anything. Oh, absolutely. Just repeat the so question. If you tell them something, they'll actually want to do the opposite. So mm -hmm. is there some way... Yeah, you know, he's the question is, how do you get your, your middle schooler to listen to you? And I completely 1,000% get it because I'm going through it, and so is all of my friends and family. Everybody I know is going through this. So that is why, because um, you don't know what you're talking about. You're, you know, right? You're, we're all dumb and stupid parents. We don't know. So what you could do is I end up getting a bunch of phone calls. So if you want your kid to call me, they can. But no, if you have friends or family that you maybe you can have discussions with together collectively and each of you have discussions or, you know, I, I did get some girls, my friends, um, my daughter's friends together and we got together and we had discussions with them. So maybe like if a couple of the parents get together and you guys kind of educate yourself a little bit and then you guys all sit down and just say, hey, we're doing this for you to be safe. But then also to the school, I know, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Sutter Middle School had the DA's office come and do some education to the kids um, last year. So maybe reach out to your school and see what kind of education they're doing. But I know that I think they're supposed to be doing some sort of curriculum um, with, with their kids. I mean, that's a really tough question. It really is to answer, because I know. One question back there. No, absolutely. It should be it should be two parents and children. That's why when I retire, hopefully soon, um, I was looking to see if that's what I could do is go to all the schools and do presentations. But there is a thing, um, Jenna's law, which another state passed, where all schools K through 12 are required to provide education for children. So hopefully at some point that's something that happens in our state. 
because and and so our our sheriff used to be on the assembly who used to deal with all this internet stuff and so he's really well versed so we have him as an outlet to be able to have him reach out to the legislators and hopefully that's something that we're going to discuss with him to try to see if we can help get that in our state because there's it's not hurting anybody there one more over here yes thinking often this is new for us as um parents excuse me um and uncomfortable conversations as well and just the thinking that these aren't one-time conversations they're over and over again it's not the school's responsibility it's not the parents it's everybody's responsibility and it's you know making sure that you know we're having them over and over again in multiple ways so that um, something sticks and even as we're having those conversations there's new conversations coming but um, it's not a one and done absolutely it is constantly something is that something that the people heard that her talk yeah, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. She made a very good point because that's exactly what it is. You constantly need to, everyone needs to be talking about it. I, I talked to my friend's kids like, hey, so so you, you have Snapchat. What have you guys been doing on Snapchat? Like I'm always prying, you know, but it's it's good to have conversations with with um, with kids and have your teachers and Girl Scouts and, you know, church. Everyone needs to have that discussion. There's monitoring apps. This is something I don't um, condone for adults monitoring their wife or their husband. Um, there's could be, you know, laws prohibiting this, but if you want to put, I've been researching all of these. I'm still trying to figure out the one I want, but these monitoring apps will monitor stuff like skin tone, curse words, uh, grooming. If they see words that are grooming related. Um, you obviously turn your phone off at a certain time. You can make sure certain apps are not on their phone or if they try to secretly do it. So if you took a picture of this and you kind of just went through and saw which ones that you liked, or at Facebook, I know Facebook has Bark on there, and there's always all, all these parents posting questions and stuff. So go to Facebook and go to Bark or go to any, what other one? Um, Thorn, Aston Critcher's doing Thorn. Okay, I'm going to change. So, okay. Two more questions, and we got to wrap up. Yes. Good evening. I'm a parent of teens. How can there be more word put out there to get intervention for parents and the teens when we're dealing with this at home, trying to do it by ourselves without support? contact at the schools I am finally getting support through birth and beyond for kids 14 through 17 but it's been a struggle trying to get those cell phones and the battle with what my kids are doing on those phones and how they're given phones at school by classmates sneaking mm -hmm. all this around and um, it's been a constant battle since school started in August but it's like yes not of us, there's not enough support for his parents out there to try to deal with it alone at home without you know consequences and stuff no you're it, it's, it's just that's the problem i don't want to get emotional but a lot of parents need support um i'm afraid of losing my kids they just lost this, a classmate was last weekend and um they're doing it on the chromebooks school issued chromebooks that are supposed to be safe and my kids are downloading porn on it having someone and i got one my kids protecting the person that gave it to them and the school can lock it after you report it to the school but the kids are still getting this stuff that's supposed to be in a safe environment no i i it's just so frustrating you know and i love our school district and it's not the school's fault it's these creeps that keep coming into our school's you know environment our safety environment for our no children. absolutely and I, i'm sorry for your your recent loss but it really is I, I, this is why I haven't promoted because I'm so like this is my thing because I really want to continue doing this because I feel like I always wonder how can we get educate parents like go to the movie theaters and do big screens do we 100% I agree with you but if you would like after this is over to get my information I can talk to you further about that I can do that Here, one more I want to thank you tonight just for coming and giving all this um, resourceful information but also, I noticed an additional topic that wasn't brought up. What about human trafficking? What is being done to educate our children about that? Because that is a huge problem that continues to just um, elude others and then pull them in as well. Thank you. No, absolutely. That's another great question. And just so you know, for the sheriff's office, we do have a specific unit that's, that's all they do is human trafficking. So we could talk to them and have them come in and do another presentation um, to discuss more details I just some of it aligns with what we do but there's a lot more stuff to human trafficking that I would like the experts to be able to discuss that with you but that's a, a very good question 
And if you want some resources, I have lots of resources I can give to you after. Okay. Thank you. Thank oh. you very much. Yes. And uh, if you want to screen capture that or take a picture of that, you can. Okay. Thank you all. And uh, one other thing, too, we have pizza in the back. I'd like to see a slice of pizza in front of everybody before, you know, during this next presentation. Um, I'd like to also recognize our uh, Folsom Cordova School Board President, Mr. David Reed. Thank you very much for being here, sir. And uh, we're going to move right on into our next uh, presentation on the uh, drug awareness side. And, and uh, that would be uh, Ms. Sutherland. Suchland. What's your names? <laughs> Nobody gets mine right ever. It's my husband's fault. Okay. Not that my maiden name was much easier, but. Okay, my name's Crystal, and I am the drug chemistry supervisor at the Sacramento County District Attorney's Crime Laboratory. Um, I've been with the lab almost 23 years. I spent about 16 years of that in toxicology where we would analyze blood and urine for DUIs, for coroners, that kind of stuff. Um, I took over the drug chemistry section, and this is where we analyze pills, powders, and plant material in cases. So basically for the DA's office to charge someone um, for having something that is illegal, we have to prove that what they had was actually illegal to have. So that is our job. I'm going to go through a little bit of basically every type of drug, because <clears throat> we see every type of drug. But the majority of this is obviously going to be on fentanyl, because that is the biggest thing that we're having issues with at this point. And this is just kind of to give you an idea of what things look like, so you can s tell what it is if you see it at home, if you see it with your kids. And they will hide stuff in, in everything. We have little plastic. Um, fun-looking cartoon containers that we get in all the time. We'll get the little, you know, pill bottles that look like just a toy, but it comes in everything. Um, definitely, we are seeing marijuana, obviously. This is our number two drug that we see in our county. Um, it has been our number two drug for a very long time, even though it is considered legal at this point, not if you're under 21 and you can't have... You know, 50 million plants of it either in on you so we still get a lot of that we also get the wax so it is basically concentrated marijuana they take out all the resin off of the plant and and concentrate it down cocaine been around forever still around um, it's our number four three four five depends on the day um, drug that we see come through our lab Methamphetamine, our number one drug. We have thousands of cases that come through our lab that are just methamphetamine. It has been our number one drug, probably will always be our number one drug. Um, obviously, they can take it, it comes in all different forms. They can smoke it, they can snort it, they can shoot it. Um, they'll used to dye it to, into different colors as a way to um, appeal to kids. They'll go to parties and be like, oh, look at this meth. It's really cool. It's pink like your dress, and give it to them in that way. That's how they try to sell stuff. Ecstasy, MDMA, which was really big a long time ago. Um, we have not seen true MDMA in a very long time. So what they're doing is they're taking meth, which is cheap. They're taking caffeine, and they're pressing it into pills and selling it for more money. Um, so basically, they're fake. They're not the true MDMA that we used to get way back in the day a few years ago. <clears throat> Heroin and opiates have been around for a very long time. We still do get a lot of this. We have seen an, a surge in mushrooms. For whatever reason, I don't know, but we have been seeing a lot of cases that involve mushrooms. And it's not just the mushrooms itself. They're coming in pills. They're coming in tablets. They're coming in candy bars. There's a whole line of can chocolate bars that are infused with psychedelic mushrooms. Um, if you go online, they're anywhere from $40 to $70 a candy bar. So they are not cheap. Um, but they are around, and they look like real candy bars. 
they're just a little bit bigger. And like I said, they're either infused with it or they have crushed um, psilocy or basically mushrooms. They crush them up and then put the powder into the candy bars when they make them. Okay, so that was a quick run through because fentanyl is obviously our problem. It, it may not be the number one drug we see, but it is the most deadly drug we see. It has gone from roughly 20, less than 20 cases in 2019 that we saw to over 450 cases last year alone. And that is why we go and we talk to schools, we talk to high schools, um, we're starting to talk to middle schools about what it looks like and the problem with it. So last year alone, we had almost double the amount of fentanyl deaths than we did hom deaths, not necessarily homicides, but deaths that involved handguns. This is what the DA's office has seen downtown. This is what, what kind of started the discussion about something needs to be done. So in 2022, we had over 200,000 200, of the fentanyl pills come through our lab in comparison to 2020, where we only had 622 pills come through. So you can see just how it has just exploded in popularity, it's exploded just in what's going on. On top of the pills, we also get it in powder form. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. Um, because last year alone, we had over 17,000 grams of powdered form fentanyl come through. So like I said, in 2019, we had fewer than 20 cases come in. Last year, we had over 450. A couple months ago, I ran the numbers. We were already up to over 350 cases. So this year, we are we don't may not have as big of cases, as big as we did in 22, but we're having more smaller cases come through. <clears throat> so what's a lethal dose? It's basically two milligrams is what a lethal dose of fentanyl is. And that is what it looks like on the end of that pencil. Kids don't see it coming. It can be in anything and everything. And it doesn't take a lot to, one, become addicted to it, and two, to kill you. The vials to the right, it's in comparison to heroin. That is a lethal dose of heroin in that first vial. Fentanyl is a second vial. And then we have something called carfentanyl. So carfentanyl is an analog of fentanyl. So basically, it's, a, it's its cousin in a way. Um, but it's an animal tranquilizer. It's not meant for human consumption. A very little, just one little grain of that can kill you. That is a fatal overdose. So what we have seen here on the West Coast is, is different than the East Coast. They have had more car fentanyl cases. We have not seen that yet. So what they have shown is East Coast, Midwest, we are where they were about four or five years ago. We have not reached the peak of this. It is still coming our way. So what we are trying to do is get the word out before we reach that peak. And hopefully we will never get to where they were or where they are. Um, but we can, do, we can only do so much. So when we're talking fentanyl in grams, like I said, we got over 17,000 grams of powdered fentanyl. So one gram is equivalent to a sugar packet. If we had a sugar packet full of just pure fentanyl, that's enough to kill about 500 people. That's how lethal it is. Obviously, we don't get pure fentanyl. They're going to cut it with other agents because obviously they want to break it up and get more money for it because it, it allows them to uh, sell more product. So what does it look like in our county? Everybody's seen this, right? The M30s, that's what's on the news a lot. It's a legitimate drug. Absolutely, fentanyl is. An M30 is supposed to be oxycodone. It has a medical use. Um, doctors can prescribe it usually for patients who um, have end-stage cancer and they are in a great deal of pain. You can get it as an anesthetic when you have surgery. All of that is obviously being well-regulated and looked at by doctors, nurses, whoever's taking care of you. If you got an M30 from your doctor, it should contain oxycodone. The pills we are getting in that look like this have fentanyl. There's no oxy in it at all. 99% of the pills, blue pills we get in, 
are fentanyl, not oxy. This is what it really looks like though. So over half of our cases, half of our fentanyl cases, now are no longer the pills, they are the powders. They're, we're either catching them before they had a chance to press them into pills, or they're just getting lazy and if you're willing to buy it in this form, cool, we're gonna sell it to you in this form. Um, these are pictures of actual cases that we received this year. And this is what we show the kiddos when we go and present to them. So they know that this isn't candy, especially coming around Halloween time. This is not candy. These are not Smarties. This is not fun dip. This is fentanyl and this will kill you. Absolutely. They're making it different colors, kind of like I talked about with the meth. They'll make it different colors so it's gonna appeal to kids. Because as soon as you can get, they can get you hooked on that, the younger they can get you hooked, then you will be a customer of theirs for the rest of your life, no matter how long that life is, because you either have to get help or you will die from this. That's the point we're at because of how much, how much we're getting in and how lethal it is. What is it mixed in? We've seen it mixed in heroin. We've seen it mixed in methamphetamine. We've seen it mixed in cocaine. We've had something called xylazine mixed in with our fentanyl. That was big on the East Coast. Again, that is a um, animal tranquilizer. But we have seen a handful of cases come through. Um, other places have reported it in marijuana and in vape pens. We have not seen that in our area yet. Not to say that it's not out there, but um, why when it is mixed in with this stuff, are they doing it on purpose? Maybe. They could be doing it, again, to try to get that person they're selling to a better high. Um, or it's a contamination, because dealers will reuse their, their baggies. So they could have fentanyl in it, and then you know, go around and put your marijuana in it or your cocaine in it. And so it just happens to get in there by contamination. We're not sure. All we know is, is it's there, so it's mixed in. So real ta tablets versus fake tablets. Um, top ones are fake, bottom ones are real. When we talk to the kids, you know, I ask them, if your friend gave you a single pill, you had nothing to compare it against, are you going to be able to tell if it's fake or not? I will tell you, we get real pill, or we get pills in, and it's hard for us to, to determine if they're real or fake. I mean, because 99% of them are fake. I mean, I'd put money on that they are fake, but... There's no way for anybody to tell. And I always get this at least once in the schools where it's like, oh, I get, you know, I get it from my friend. I trust my friend. We're cool. I'm like, great. I'm glad you had great friends. But do you trust the guy he got it from and the guy he got it from? Because I guarantee that pillar powder has been through a dozen hands before it got to you. And you have no idea what those people did to that. And it's trying to get the kids to think outside of their bubble, honestly. So DEA, when we test stuff, we do not quant quantitate it. We just qualitate. We're just like, what's in it? I don't care how much is in it. It's illegal to have. I'm just saying what's in it. Last year, DEA actually qualitated a bunch of the tablets, and they found over 60% of the tablets had a lethal dose, so had over the 2 milligrams. Majority of them had up to 11 milligrams. That's enough to kill, what, five people? So when I talk to the kids, again, I say, what does this mean to you? That means if I lay out 10 pills in front of you and I tell you six of those pills can kill you, are you willing to take that chance? Are you willing to take one of those pills? And I hope that they're not, but that's, that's what we're living with right now. So from 2015 to 2022, and this is kind of one of our new slides that we we show in the eight, over, across the board, we're gonna see an average of about a 772% increase in fentanyl deaths, or deaths due to fentanyl, usually overdose. That is what we see in that age group, 14 to 18. That is how much it has gone up, over 4,000%. So why? 
kids today are the most connected that generation that there ever has been because of what we just heard about. Phones, gaming, um, iPads, this, that, and the other, they're always online. Drug dealers, that's exactly what they do. One of the families we talk with and go around and, and talk about their son who passed away, that's how he got his drug, is because he was at the mall, a drug dealer went to the, the food court and dropped a menu on Snapchat. Here's the pills I have, come find me over here. They bought two pills a piece. They took one pill, him and his friend, it did nothing. He decided to try the second one, it killed him. And he died alone, laying his head down on his computer on the day after Christmas. So he thought he was taking a Percocet. He, had no, he didn't intend to take fentanyl, he didn't know he was taking fentanyl. And that's we're trying to change the verbiage on that too. He didn't overdose, he was poisoned. Overdose is when you know what you're taking and you take too much of it. Poisoning is you think you're taking one thing and it's actually something else. So these dealers are poisoning the, children, the kids because they, they don't care, first of all. Half the time they don't even know what they're selling. But when kids go to them and say, hey, do you have one of these? I always tell them they're not going to say, no, I don't, send you to the next guy. They want your money. They're just going to say, yeah, I have that. Here you go. So they, they obviously they don't know what they're selling half the time, but they're going to tell them what they want to hear. In 2014, heroin was our biggest drug that we saw overdose-wise. In 2022, fentanyl overtook that by a lot. So we had over 75, almost, almost 75, 74,000 deaths in the United States. Over 100,000 was overdoses, 74,000 74, of those was due to fentanyl. This is how many people it killed in 2021, over 74,000. This is equivalent to an airplane going down every day, 200 people a day. If an airplane was crashing every day, would we not stop and have that conversation? So that's what we're trying to do here. You know, we show the kids this, this is how many people die. And there's, there's just so much out there, you know, the media talks about it, but it's all on the kids. And if there's only so much we can do with the law and with people who are selling it, that we have to hit it from the other direction too. Try to educate the kids on this is what it does to you, this is what it can do to you, and let it make the, help them make that decision that it's something that they don't want to do. So we've all heard of Narcan, right? This is what's going to reverse the effects of an opiate. Fentanyl, heroin, Oxy, hydrocodone, all of the opiates can be reversed by Narcan. You cannot get high with Narcan. The only reason it was created was to reverse the effects of an opiate. We always talk about what the symptoms are. Because if a kid's at a party and their friend took something, they put them in the corner to, quote, sleep it off, they're not sleeping it off. They are dying. Your friend is dying beside you while you are playing video games. And that has happened more times than not because they did not know the signs of what an overdose looks like. So we usually go through all this for them. Um, but you know your friends. You know what they're supposed to act like. You know what they look like when they're fine. But when you start to see the pinpoint pupils, they start to be lethargic. This is something that we tell them, call 911. It doesn't matter if they get there and it was a false alarm. We'd ra that person's parent would rather it be false alarm than get the call from the coroner or from the hospital saying that their child has overdosed. And we always have fire come with us to talk to say, yeah, our job, their job is to save that life. They're not going to sit there and you know take down names and who was there and, and all that. They are there to save that person and they're the only ones who can do it. Narcan will buy you about two to three minutes. Um, if someone is overdosing, they, you're supposed to use a nose spray once. If they come to, you know, just put them in a recovery position, then 
if they start to go out again, give them the second dose. Each dose will probably last, depending on how much they have in their system, two to three minutes. Average time for a fire to get to your house is seven minutes. So that buys you enough time, your brain getting oxygen, to hopefully help save you. Up in Sutter, not Sutter, Yolo County, Yuba County, one of them, we had a case where an individual was given 14 doses of Narcan. Everything that was in the sheriff's car vehicle, everything that was at the station, everything that was in in the, the um, ambulance, they still died. So either they had an incredible amount of fentanyl in them, or it was also mixed with something. Because don't forget, Narcan will only work on an opiate. So if it's mixed, if your fentanyl is mixed with something like xylazine or another depressant, it will not work on that. And that is why we emphasize always, always, always call 911 first. At least get them on their way because it's going to take them about seven minutes to get to you. Um, so it's kind of a rundown. Call 911. If you give CPR, do not give mouth to mouth. We had one case down in Riverside where the father gave mouth to mouth to his daughter. She still had fentanyl residue in her mouth. He died. She was saved. Um, so you never know. Chest compressions all day long. Go for it. But don't give mouth to mouth. Um, Narcan only works on opiates. Do not use hand sanitizer. I know that's like, don't say that in the world of COVID. Um, but fentanyl will not go through your skin. You have to get it on a mucous membrane in your eyes and your nose and your mouth. Or if you use hand sanitizer, because the alcohol allows it to absorb through your skin. Soap and water, you'll be fine. That works. <laughs> we'll go to questions. Yes, now. questions, so questions. questions out there. Yes. I'm, we're going to bring you to mic if you don't mind, sir. So Narcan's available for free from CVS, Walgreens, Costco, all these other pharmacies. Is that correct? Um, I know it is free from the health department. Um, I know my CVS said they charge twenty dollars. <laughs> so my yeah. CVS gave it to me for free. Really? We keep a we keep a dose and uh, yeah. our thing. I, I used to work with in the Navy with lots of sailors. We had uh, several overdoses. Yeah, and we had Narcan available. So if they're giving it for free now, cool. That's yeah. what I, I recommend. And my, my question for the district is, do, do the schools have Narcan available at the schools and are people trained in its use? The answer is yes and yes. We have uh, Narcan available at all our schools and we have not only our training nurses, but our front office staff. We've actually started training our campus monitors and our yard uh, supervisors as well with Narcan. I mean, here in the last, uh, I think three months, we probably trained over 150 of our staff members. That's great you know, to hear. We still you. have a lot more to go, but that is part of our training protocol now. And I highly recommend it. I have it in my purse. My daughter's boyfriend has it. We have it all everywhere in the house. I'm not, I hope to never have to use it, but it's there if we do. Yeah. There's a lot of talk about like middle school and high school, mm -hmm. but as an elementary school teacher and seeing my kids in high school, and like I watched this forum like years ago before my kids were even in school. It's like, what are we doing as preventative? Like what is, I know back then watching it was like making connections with the kids. Like sleep was a big thing. Mm -hmm. But like what, I guess that's the district question. Like what can we do in elementary school to kind of prevent, or what do you see as a preventative measure that we can kind of just lay the foundation? Sure. Because right now we're just picking up. Yeah, no, honestly, my kids have had it beat in their heads since they were little. I mean, because that's what I did, you know. Um, the youngest classes I've talked to are fifth and sixth graders. And the school actually reached out to me because they had a child say when he grew up he wanted to be a dealer. And so we had a conversation about that, what that really meant. And I think, you know, not hiding stuff, kind of just being open, at least from my perspective, is helpful. That's why it's like, you know what, no one wants to talk about it. Here it is. This is what it can do to your body. And this is what it does and how it kills you. And, you know, we answer all the kids' questions, too. We open it up at the end when we talk to them and say, okay, what do you want to know? I'm here. This is your time. You know, no, no question's a stupid question. And you'd be surprised at how once the first question's asked, there has to be the first one, it gets going. And, and some of the good questions that they actually have. And middle schoolers are way more open, honestly. I love talking to middle schoolers 
rather than high schoolers because <laughs> I don't have that teenage attitude yet. Um, but no, I mean, the, the, the high schoolers are great too. And I think a lot of them, that's what they need to know. But it's amazing that the middle schoolers have so many questions. And I just, I think the high schoolers are, are kind of afraid to ask because they have their friends right beside them. But um, yeah, I mean, last year we did a lot of the big high schools. This year we're doing more of the middle schools. So hopefully catching them younger and getting them to talk about it and realizing, hey, it's not a bad thing to talk about, um, but this is what's out there. And we hope, you know, obviously we're not going to be able to, to touch every kid and, and get them out there, but hopefully they're talking about it with their friends. And hopefully there's that one brave person, you know, at that party that's willing to call 911 when something doesn't look right um, and, just, and just have that courage to do that. Yeah. Well, What's the message you gave to your kids, and at what age? <laughs> um, if you're willing to share. Yeah, well, that's going way back because I have teenagers, <laughs> and it's been a long week. Um, <laughs> honestly, they've always just been around when I've when I've come home and and talked about. Oh, you know, we went to give a class today, and they've always just been with me. So you know, we've been driving. It's like, oh, you know, look at that. He he looks like he's high, or he looks like he's driving. You know, and then. I'll, I'll say something, and then the kid's like, what does that mean? Oh, whoops. So you have to, you know, but it's like, why, why are we saying oops? That's not a good thing. You know, that's, I, I, I've always been open to them. Like, you know, this is what this drug can do to you. You know, especially when they started to get into junior high. Now, my kids, their classes and their friends and stuff, we always did, they always brought me in, this elementary school would bring me in. And so I would always do a general talk about well, what do we do at the crime lab? Usually fourth or fifth grade. And then in sixth grade, it's like, okay, you're going to junior high. It's a whole new world. This is what drugs look like. And I got a call from one of my daughter's friends and she's like, it was right before Halloween. She's like, oh my goodness, my daughter just gave me all of her smarties she got from trigger trading because <laughs> she thought they looked like ecstasy. And she's like, and I love Smarties, so <laughs> thank you. So, you know, and that's one thing that we're afraid of, you know, are the parents going to be open? Like, I don't, want, I don't want you to talk to my kids about that because they're too young. I'd rather be talking to them than their friends or the dealer. So I know when we go, they always give, you know, the opt-out form when we talk to schools. So, you know, that, that's up to the parents. But, yeah, I mean... There really wasn't a, a particular age because my daughter is three years older than my son, so he was always around. So he heard it way younger than she did. Um, but it, yeah, it was just always a, a topic in our house because that was my job. I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what you're saying as a counselor um, and a therapist. I just think it's really important as parents that um, a lot of times I hear from parents and families that um, they're scared. They don't want to talk about it to their students because they're too young or we don't, we're scared that they're going to go do it now. Right. We're giving them the idea of um, using drugs, drinking alcohol, having sex, being on social media, whatever it is. But I just want to say working in the schools and working with children for over 20 years is that they're seeing it, they're hearing it they're experiencing it in different forms so the more open and the more communication and i think that's been part of the theme tonight is that communication is key and if we can communicate with our children and teach them coping skills and um, not be afraid or um, worried about setting boundaries with them that's going to be huge we still are the parents and we it's okay to set boundaries it's okay for them to be mad at us it's okay for them to um know about some of these things because they're seeing it they're hearing it um, and it is happening in middle and elementary school so um, i think if we can start doing that earlier um, it's preventative and it's not intervention or we're not having as many kids um, die from this type of stuff or come in contact with it more often and i think it also goes with the whole mental health as well because why are these kids going to something it's not always just to see what it is, you know. The drug, the drug world back, you know, from the 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s is not what it is today. You cannot experiment and expect to survive because of, of this, because of fentanyl. You just can't. And 
at the end of one of our things, we got a call from a counselor who said a student came up to her and said, I'm addicted, I know I'm addicted, I don't wanna die, and asked to, to, to go into a rehab. So they were, they were able to save that student. And just being open and, and not doing the whole stigma on it and just being, you know, helpful and let's let's talk about it instead of oh this is you know taboo or or whatever they feel is you know it is hard but it's just not the world we grew up in it's not the world you know their parents or grandparents or aunt and uncles grew up in even their brothers and sisters it's different and it's it's unfortunate that they have to do this that they have to deal with it but it's there um another question I always get what if what if I, I take a pill, can I Narcan myself? Okay, so no, <laughs> because by the time you realize you need it, you are too far gone and you cannot come back from that. You cannot give it to yourself. So then the next question was, well, what if I just take the pill and then shoot the Narcan? Okay, then what is the point of taking that pill, right? So you're just gonna take it, you're taking something you want to alter how you're feeling, but you're gonna get take something else that's gonna block it. So these are some of the questions that I get <laughs> when I when I go to these schools. Um, you know, what is it? How do they make it? And then questions like that, which I said no no questions stupid because I'm sure these kids are gonna try that. You know, but we also talk about the inconsistencies, like these dealers, these cartels, they're making this in buckets in a garage, in a, in a basement. So they'll throw the narc, or the narcan, they'll throw the fentanyl into the bucket, put in the, the cutting agents and mix it in a, stir it around. Then they just start scooping it out and pressing the pills. So the first pill that comes out of that may have no fentanyl in it at all. By the time you get to the bottom, has enough to kill you and about 10 of your friends. That's how inconsistent it is. So we've had people who die just taking a quarter of a pill because they know that. They know that that's what's happening. They've been on it for so long and they still die because there was so much fentanyl in it. Even within a, in a tablet, and we've seen this when we do our testing, you cut the tablet in half, the half we took, there's like a tiny little peak of fentanyl. So we do the other half and there's a huge peak on our, on our instrument. So it's, one, you don't know what you're getting when you buy things off the street and it's just so inconsistent. They, it's not a pharmaceutical company making this stuff. Yep. I want to make sure the uh, folks online, if you have questions, then please click on your, uh, raise your hand or we'll unmute you so we can hear your questions as well. In the meantime, uh, I do want to say, you know, I appreciate uh, both our presenters coming out today because I think this information is vital. This information is vital. And as a parent, you know, um, I mean, they, they, I, even I learned some new things. And, and I've been in this business for 35 years. You know, even I learned something new tonight. And I know that uh, this is something that is constantly evolving. So if we don't do something and continue to communicate, um, I know, you know, one was talking about, you know, what do you do? You keep talking to your kids. You keep talking to your kids and you, you got to give them that information because if you don't, someone else will and information they give them, is not gonna be right. It's gonna be counterproductive of what you're trying to teach your, your, your student. So keep that in mind. The Narcan? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the question was, can you still use Narcan if it's expired? If that's all you have, yes. <laughs> I mean, yes, it does have an expiration date, so you kind of want to watch that. Um, but yeah, if that's the only thing you have, use it. You're not, you're not going to hurt yourself by by using it or hurt the person by using it. And also, we have the obviously the Good Samaritan Law in as well, so you cannot be punished for if you're in good conscience trying to help somebody and they still pass away. Okay, we have one question from Teresa online and we should be able to hear her. Teresa? Yes, hi. Hi, thank you. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. I have a high schooler who is just not willing to talk about this problem, fentanyl. She indicated that, you know, 
the school talks about it too much that she's becoming uh, unsensitized. How to help her understand the situation, the problem, the dimension of the problem when she is uh, desensitized already? I mean, I can see that because because it is everywhere. Um, that's a tough one, though. I mean, all you can do is hope that she got the message, I think, and maybe talk to it in different ways about different stories. Like, hey, I saw this this mom who lost her, her child, you know, in your school. Did you know them? And try to get it from a different direction because um, there's always... There's always someone in the school, the school district, who um, was lost to this. But when we go to schools, that's kind of what, that's why we have three different ways of hitting it. I hit it from the science side. We have our attorney there sometimes that will talk, our district attorney there who will talk about the law side of it. And then we have the family there to talk about their loss. So there are three different, if, you know, kid doesn't like science, but they like law, they might take an interest in that. Or, you know, they hear this, the story of the parents who lost their kids, and they'll take an interest in that. So, I mean, I, for me, unless you guys have anything else, I, I think it's hard, and I do think kids do get desensitized, but I think it's stuff that they still need to hear. And I think that, hit, you know, opening it up in a different way can be helpful. Um, the question was, have we seen any exposures in primary schools? Not that I'm aware of. I'm sure it's there. Um, pre, I mean, we've had babies exposed, so they're not even in school yet. Um, we've had one of the people that we talk with that is with Arrive Alive that goes with us to schools. Um, their child's preschool actually found some on the, on the playground that I think someone was running and tossed it over because they thought they were going to get caught with it. So yes and no. <laughs> um, not explicitly where we've gotten the call and it was like, oh, this is a, like a second grader. Um, they're usually junior high, high school, and or babies that basically have no control over it, but were exposed in the environment they were. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming and, uh, you know, giving us your time this evening. I think the information is, is invaluable. And I want to thank our, our presenters. Thank you all very much. Round of applause, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. Since I didn't see anyone uh, eating pizza during the uh, presentation, then I should see a pizza slice going out the door with you. So please. And thank you all very much. Oh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we have a QR code up here. If you can click on that. And fill out the uh, survey. There's a couple of questions in there. It won't take you more than uh, five minutes. You know, that's information that we can use to assist us and, you know, bring in more and different uh, presentations and getting a voice from the uh, audience, you know, what, what you'd like to see. And if you have any additional questions, we'll make sure that we forward those to the uh, presenters as well. So thank you all. Hey.